Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Art of Strategic Planning. Chapter 1, Laying Plans. Sun Tzu once said that the art of war is of vital importance to the state. It is a matter of life and death, a path to either safety or ruin. Hence, it cannot be ignored as a field of study. The art of war is governed by five constant factors, essential in one's deliberations when strategizing for battlefield conditions. These are Moral law aligns the people with their rulers so they will follow him in the face of any danger. Heaven represents day and night, cold and heat, the seasons. Earth encompasses distances, terrain, danger and safety, open grounds and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. The commander symbolizes virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and strictness. Method and discipline refers to organizing the army, ranks among officers, securing supply lines, and managing military expenses. Every general should be familiar with these elements. Knowledge of them means victory, ignorance means defeat. Therefore, when deliberating, use these factors for comparison. Which ruler adheres to the moral law? Which general possesses more ability? Who holds the advantages granted by heaven and earth? On which side are discipline and order most rigorously enforced? Which army is stronger? Whose troops are better trained? In which army is there greater consistency in reward and punishment? By considering these seven aspects, I can forecast victory or defeat. Generals who listen to my counsel and act upon it will conquer. Those who do not will fail. While heeding my advice, also take advantage of any beneficial circumstances beyond the normal rules. Modify your plans according to the situation. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we make the enemy believe we are far. When far, we make them believe we are near. Use baits to lure the enemy, feign disorder, and crush them. If the enemy is secure at all points, be ready for them. If they are superior, evade them. If your opponent is temperamental, seek to irritate them. Pretend to be weak, so they may grow arrogant. If they are taking rest, give them no peace. If their forces are united, separate them. Attack when they are unprepared and appear where you are not expected. These strategies leading to victory should not be revealed beforehand. The general who wins a battle makes many calculations in his temple before the battle. The general who loses makes only a few calculations beforehand. Thus, many calculations lead to victory, and few calculations to defeat. How much more no calculation at all? It is by attention to this point that I can foresee who is likely to win or lose. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Cost and Strategy of Warfare. Chapter 2, Waging War. Sun Tzu once said, in the operations of war, if you deploy thousands of fast chariots, heavy chariots, and a hundred thousand well-armed soldiers, the daily expenses, including the costs at home and at the front, hospitality, minor items like glue and paint, and expenditures on chariots and armor, can reach a thousand ounces of silver a day. Such is the cost of maintaining an army of a hundred thousand. When you engage in actual combat, if victory is delayed, the men's weapons will become blunt and their zeal will wane. Laying siege to a town will sap your strength. Moreover, if a military campaign drags on, the nation's resources will not withstand the strain. At this point, if your weapons are blunt, zeal dampened, strength exhausted, and treasury depleted, other rulers will take advantage of your extremity. Then, no one, however wise, can avert the inevitable consequences. Thus, while we have heard of foolish haste in war, cleverness has never been seen in prolonged warfare. No country has ever benefited from protracted conflict. Only those who fully comprehend the horrors of war can understand the most profitable way to conduct it. A skilled soldier avoids a second conscription and does not load his supply wagons twice. Carry your own war materials, but forage from the enemy. This way, the army has enough food for its needs. 
the state's financial difficulties lead to maintaining an army from a distance, which in turn impoverishes the people. On the other hand, the army's proximity causes inflation, draining the people's resources. With depleted resources and exhausted strength, people will suffer heavy taxation. The costs of maintaining broken chariots, worn out horses, armor, bows and arrows, spears, shields, mantles, oxen, and heavy wagons will consume a significant portion of the state's revenue. Therefore, a wise general forages from the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to 20 of your own, and a single unit of their fodder equals 20 from your own stock. To defeat the enemy, our men must be incited to anger and rewarded for their victories. In chariot combat, reward those who capture the first enemy chariots. Replace the enemy's flags with ours, mix the chariots and use them together. Treat captured soldiers well. This is called augmenting one's strength with the conquered foe. In warfare, focus on victory, not on prolonged campaigns. The leader of armies determines the people's fate and decides whether the nation will be in peace or peril. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Art of Strategic Offense Chapter 3, Attack by Stratagem Sun Tzu said, in the practical art of war, the best strategy is to take the enemy's country whole and intact. It is less ideal to destroy it. Similarly, it's better to capture an entire army, regiment, detachment, or company than to annihilate them. Therefore, to fight and conquer in all your battles is not the epitome of excellence. The supreme excellence lies in breaking the enemy's resistance without a fight. The highest form of generalship is to thwart the enemy's plans. The next best is to prevent the junction of the enemy's forces. After that, attacking the enemy's army in the field is advisable, and the worst strategy is to besiege walled cities. The rule is to avoid besieging walled cities if possible. The preparation of siege equipment and other war implements can take up to three whole months, and constructing mounds for attack can take another three months. A general who cannot control his irritation will launch his men into a futile assault like swarming ants, leading to heavy losses without capturing the town. Such are the catastrophic effects of a siege. Therefore, a skilled leader subdues the enemy's troops without battle. He captures their cities without laying siege and overthrows their kingdom without lengthy operations in the field. With his forces intact, he will contest the control of the empire, achieving complete triumph without losing a single soldier. This is the method of attacking by stratagem. In war, the rule is to surround the enemy if our forces are 10 to his 1, attack if 5 to 1, divide our army into 2 if twice as numerous, offer battle if equally matched, avoid the enemy if slightly inferior, and flee if completely outmatched. Hence, a small force, however determined, will eventually be overcome by a larger force. The general is the nation's support. If the support is firm, the nation is strong. If it is flawed, the nation is weak. Three ways a ruler can bring misfortune to his army, by commanding advance or retreat without understanding the army's capabilities, by governing the army as he does the kingdom, causing unrest among the soldiers, by employing officers indiscriminately, ignoring the principle of adaptation to circumstances, shaking the soldiers' confidence. Restlessness in the army invites trouble from other feudal lords, bringing anarchy and losing victory. Thus, there are five essentials for victory. 1. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. 2. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. 3. He will win whose army is animated by the same spirit. 4. He will win who, prepared himself, takes the enemy unprepared. 5. He will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Wisdom of Tactical Dispositions Chapter 4, Tactical Dispositions Sun Tzu once said, ancient skilled fighters first ensured they could not be defeated and then sought opportunities to defeat their enemies. 
Securing oneself against defeat depends on one's efforts, but the opportunity to defeat the enemy is provided by the enemy themselves. Thus, a skilled fighter can ensure his own invincibility but may not necessarily secure victory over the enemy. This is why one may know how to conquer without being capable of doing it. Protecting oneself against defeat suggests defensive tactics, while the ability to defeat the enemy indicates offensive tactics. Staying on the defensive implies inadequate strength, while attacking signifies an abundance of strength. A general skilled in defense conceals himself as if hidden deep beneath the earth, while one skilled in attack moves as swiftly and forcefully as lightning from the heavens. Therefore, we have the capability to protect ourselves on one hand and achieve complete victory on the other. Recognizing victory only when it is apparent to the common eye is not the pinnacle of excellence. Nor is it excellence if you fight and conquer and the whole empire applauds. Lifting a hair is no demonstration of great strength. Seeing the sun and moon doesn't mean sharp sight. Hearing thunder doesn't signify a keen ear. The ancients described a clever fighter as one who not only wins, but excels in winning with ease. His victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. He wins by making no mistakes. Avoiding mistakes establishes the certainty of victory, for it means conquering an already defeated enemy. Therefore, the skilled fighter places himself in a position where defeat is impossible and does not miss the opportunity to defeat the enemy. In war, the victorious strategist seeks battle only after the victory has been secured, whereas one who is destined to defeat first fights and then seeks victory. The consummate leader cultivates moral law and adheres strictly to method and discipline, thus controlling the outcome. In terms of military methods, we have measurement, estimation of quantity, calculation, balancing of chances, and victory. Measurement owes to earth, estimation of quantity to measurement, calculation to estimation, balancing of chances to calculation, and victory to the balancing of chances. An army victorious against a routed one is like placing a pound against a grain on a scale. The rush of a conquering force is like water bursting through a dam into a chasm thousands of feet deep. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, Harnessing Energy Chapter 5, Energy Sun Tzu once said, the control of large and small forces is based on the same principles, it is merely a matter of organizing their numbers. Commanding a large army is no different from commanding a small one if you have established effective signals and signs to withstand the enemy's attack and remain firm. This can be achieved through direct and indirect maneuvers, allowing your force to impact with the strength of a grindstone against an egg. This is achieved through the science of understanding weak and strong points. In combat, the direct approach is used for engagement, but indirect methods are necessary to secure victory. Efficient application of indirect tactics is as limitless as the heavens and earth, unending like the flow of rivers and streams. They begin anew like the sun and moon, and return like the four seasons. There are only five musical notes, yet the combinations of these five create more melodies than can ever be heard. There are only five primary colors, yet their combinations produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are only five cardinal tastes, yet their combinations yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle, there are only two methods of attack, the direct and the indirect. Yet their combinations give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and indirect lead into each other in turn, moving in a circle without end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? The onset of troops is like the rush of a torrent that carries stones in its flow. The quality of decision is like the well-timed swoop of a falcon, enabling it to strike and destroy its prey. Therefore, the good fighter is formidable in his onset and swift in his decisions. Energy is likened to the tension of a crossbow and decision to the releasing of the arrow. Amidst the turmoil and tumult of battle, there may be apparent disorder, yet no real disorder at all. Amid confusion and chaos, your array may seem disorganized but will be invincible. Simulated disorder implies perfect discipline, simulated fear implies courage, and simulated weakness implies strength. Hiding order beneath the cloak of disorder is a matter of division. Concealing courage under a show of timidity implies a reserve of latent energy. 
masking strength with weakness is to be achieved by tactical dispositions. Thus, one who is skilled at keeping the enemy on the move maintains deceptive appearances according to which the enemy will act. He sacrifices minor advantages to lure the enemy. By baiting, he keeps the enemy marching, then with a concentrated force, he lies in wait for them. The clever commander considers the effect of combined energy and doesn't overburden individuals, harnessing collective power. When he utilizes combined energy, his troops become like rolling logs or stones. It is the nature of a log or stone to remain still on level ground and move on a slope, if square, to stop, but if round, to roll. Thus, the momentum of skilled fighters is like a round stone rolling down a mountain thousands of feet high. Such is the discussion on the subject of energy. A modern interpretation of the art of war by Sun Tzu, understanding weaknesses and strengths. Chapter 6, Weak Points and Strong. Sun Tzu said, the one who arrives first on the battlefield and waits for the enemy will be fresh for the fight. Conversely, the one who arrives second and has to rush to battle will arrive exhausted. Therefore, the clever combatant imposes his will on the enemy but does not allow the enemy's will to be imposed upon him. By offering advantages, he can make the enemy approach of their own accord, or by inflicting damage, he can make it impossible for the enemy to draw near. If the enemy is relaxed, he can be harassed. If well supplied, he can be starved. If quietly encamped, he can be forced to move. Appear at points the enemy must rush to defend, and march swiftly to places where you are not expected. An army can march long distances without distress if it moves through territory not occupied by the enemy. You can ensure success in your attacks by only striking at undefended places and ensure the safety of your defense by only holding positions that cannot be attacked. Thus, a general is skilled in attack when his opponent does not know what to defend, and he is skilled in defense when his opponent does not know what to attack. No divine art of subtlety and secrecy enables us to be invisible and inaudible, and hence we can control the enemy's fate. Advance irresistibly by attacking the enemy's weak points, and retreat safely from pursuit if your movements are more rapid than the enemy's. If we wish to engage the enemy, even if he is sheltered behind a high rampart and deep ditch, we only need to attack somewhere else that he will be compelled to rescue. If we do not wish to fight, we can prevent the enemy from engaging us, even if our encampment is merely outlined on the ground, by creating diversions. By understanding the enemy's dispositions while remaining unseen, we can keep our forces concentrated, while the enemies must be divided. We can form a unified force against fragmented parts of the enemy, outnumbering them significantly. Attacking an inferior force with a superior one places our opponents in dire straits. The place where we choose to fight should not be known to the enemy, for then he must prepare against possible attacks at several points, and his forces, thus distributed, will be few where we attack. If he strengthens one part of his force, he weakens another. If he sends reinforcements everywhere, he will be weak everywhere. Numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks, and numerical strength from compelling the adversary to make these preparations. Knowing the time and place of the battle, we can concentrate forces from great distances to fight. But if neither time nor place is known, the left cannot support the right, the right cannot support the left, the front cannot support the rear, nor the rear the front. Even if soldiers exceed ours in number, that will not benefit them in achieving victory. Victory can be achieved, though the enemy be stronger. Discover his plans and the likelihood of their success, provoke him, and learn his pattern of activity or inactivity. Force him to reveal himself to find his weak points. Compare the enemy's army with your own, identifying where strength is superabundant and where it is deficient. In tactical dispositions, the highest achievement is to conceal them. Hidden dispositions are safe from the prying of the subtlest spies and the schemes of the wisest brains. How victory can be produced from the enemy's tactics is beyond the comprehension of the multitude. All can see the tactics of conquest, but none can see the strategy from which victory evolves. Do not repeat the tactics that have gained you one victory, but adapt your methods to the infinite variety of circumstances. Military tactics are like unto water, avoiding the strong and striking the weak. Water shapes its course according to the ground, 
and the soldier works out his victory concerning the foe he faces. Just as water has no constant shape, there are no constant conditions in warfare. The one who can modify tactics in relation to the opponent and succeed in winning may be called a heaven-born captain. The five elements, water, fire, wood, metal, earth, are not always equally predominant. The four seasons make way for each other in turn. There are short days and long, the moon waxes and wanes. Modern interpretation of the art of war by Sun Tzu, mastery of maneuvering. Chapter 7, Maneuvering. Sun Tzu said, in warfare, the general receives his orders from the sovereign. Once an army is assembled and forces are concentrated, he must blend and harmonize the different elements before setting up camp. Following this comes tactical maneuvering, which is the most challenging aspect of warfare. The complexity of tactical maneuvering lies in transforming indirect routes into direct ones and turning misfortune into advantage. To take a long and circuitous route, luring the enemy out of position, and then to outpace him to the destination, demonstrates mastery of the art of diversion. Maneuvering a disciplined army is advantageous, whereas with an undisciplined multitude, it is perilous. If you dispatch a fully equipped army to seize an advantage, you will likely be too late. However, sending a fast-moving detachment may require sacrificing equipment and supplies. For instance, if you command your troops to undertake forced marches day and night, covering double the usual distance to seize an advantage, the leaders of all three divisions may fall into enemy hands. The strongest soldiers will be at the front, while the exhausted ones will fall behind, resulting in only a fraction of your army reaching its destination. Marching 50 Li for outmaneuvering the enemy might cost you the leader of your first division, with only half of your force arriving. Marching 30 Li could result in only two-thirds of your army reaching the destination. Hence, an army without its baggage train is lost. Without provisions, it is lost. Without a supply base, it is lost. We cannot enter alliances until we understand our neighbor's intentions. Leading an army is unsuitable unless we are familiar with the terrain, including mountains, forests, pitfalls, cliffs, marshes, and swamps. Using local guides is essential to leverage natural advantages. In war, practice deception for success. Whether to concentrate or divide your troops must be decided by circumstances. Be swift as the wind in your rapidity and compact as a forest. In raiding and plundering, be like fire and in immovability, be like a mountain. Keep your plans as dark and impenetrable as night and when you move, strike like a thunderbolt. When plundering the countryside, divide the spoils among your troops. When capturing new territories, allocate them for the benefit of your soldiers. Think carefully before making a move. He who has mastered the art of deviation will conquer. This is the art of maneuvering. The Book of Army Management states that on the battlefield, spoken words do not carry far, hence the use of gongs and drums. Ordinary objects cannot be seen clearly, hence the use of banners and flags. These tools focus the ears and eyes of the army on a particular point, forming a single united body. In night fighting, use signal fires and drums. In day fighting, use flags and banners to influence your army's ears and eyes. A soldier's spirit is keenest in the morning, by noon it begins to flag, and in the evening, his mind is only on returning to camp. A clever general avoids an army when its spirit is keen and attacks when it is sluggish and inclined to return. This is the art of steadying moods. Disciplined and calm, await the appearance of disorder among the enemy. Be near the goal while the enemy is still far from it, at ease while the enemy toils. Be well fed while the enemy is famished. This is the art of conserving strength. Do not intercept an enemy with orderly banners or attack a well-arrayed army. This is the art of steadying circumstances. It's a military axiom not to advance uphill against the enemy or to oppose him when he comes downhill. Do not pursue an enemy simulating flight or attack soldiers with high morale. Avoid enemy bait and do not interfere with an army returning home. When surrounding an army, leave an outlet free. Do not press a desperate enemy too hard. This is the art of warfare. Modern interpretation of the art of war by Sun Tzu, tactical variability. 
Chapter 8, Variation and Tactics Sun Tzu said, in warfare, the general receives his orders from the sovereign, assembles his army, and concentrates his forces. In challenging terrain, do not encamp, at crossroads, join forces with allies, avoid staying in dangerously isolated positions. When trapped, resort to stratagems, in desperate situations, you must fight. There are paths you must not take, armies you must not attack, cities that must be besieged, and positions that must not be contested. There are commands from the sovereign that should not be obeyed. A general who fully understands the benefits of tactical variability knows how to command his troops. Without this understanding, a general may know the lay of the land, but cannot translate that knowledge into practical success. Thus, a student of war who does not master the art of varying plans, even if familiar with the five advantages, will fail to make the best use of his men. Hence, in the plans of a wise leader, considerations of advantage and disadvantage are blended together. By tempering our expectations of advantage, we may succeed in accomplishing the essential parts of our schemes. On the other hand, always ready to seize an opportunity amidst difficulties, we can extricate ourselves from misfortune. Weaken enemy leaders by inflicting damage, causing them trouble, and keeping them constantly engaged. Lure them to specific points with deceptive promises. The art of war teaches us not to rely on the enemy's reluctance to advance, but on our readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but on our having made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults that may affect a general, recklessness leading to destruction, cowardice leading to capture, a hasty temper susceptible to provocation, a delicacy of honor sensitive to shame, and over-concern for his troops leading to anxiety and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is defeated and its leader killed, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be subjects for deep reflection. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, Marching and Positioning the Army. Chapter 9, The Army on the March. Sun Tzu said, we now address the question of encamping the army and observing signs of the enemy. When traversing mountains, pass quickly and stay near valleys. Camp in high places, facing the sun, and avoid climbing heights to engage in battle. This is the strategy for mountain warfare. After crossing a river, you should distance yourself from it. If an invading force crosses a river, do not confront it in the middle of the stream. It's best to allow half of the enemy's army to cross before launching an attack. If eager to engage, do not meet the invader near a river they must cross. Anchor your craft higher up than the enemy and face the sun. Do not move upstream to meet the enemy. This is the strategy for river warfare. In crossing salt marshes, your primary concern should be to cross them quickly without delay. If forced to fight in a salt marsh, ensure you have water and grass nearby and position yourself with your back to a cluster of trees. This is the strategy for operating in salt marshes. In flat, dry country, choose easily accessible positions with high ground to your right and rear. This ensures that danger is in front and safety lies behind. This is the strategy for campaigning in flat terrain. These strategies enabled the Yellow Emperor to defeat four sovereigns. All armies prefer high to low ground and sunny places to dark. If you take care of your soldiers and camp on firm ground, the army will be free from disease, leading to victory. When you come to a hill or a bank, occupy the sunny side with the slope at your right rear. This benefits your soldiers and utilizes the ground's natural advantages. When a river you wish to ford is swollen due to heavy rains, wait until it subsides. Avoid areas with precipitous cliffs, running torrents, deep hollows, confined places, tangled thickets, quagmires, and crevices. Lead the enemy towards such places while keeping them at your rear. If there are hidden ponds, reed-filled hollows, or thick undergrowth near your camp, search them thoroughly as they may hide ambushes or spies. If the enemy is nearby and remains quiet, they rely on their position's natural strength. If they stay aloof and try to provoke battle, they want you to advance. An easily accessible enemy camp is a bait. Movements in a forest indicate the enemy's advance, 
screens and thick grass mean the enemy wishes to make you suspicious. Birds rising in flight signal an ambush. Startled beasts indicate an impending attack. High, vertical dust signifies chariots. Low, widespread dust suggests infantry. Diverging dust trails indicate firewood gathering. Moving dust means encampment. Humble words with increased preparations indicate an enemy advance. Aggressive language and posture suggest retreat. Light chariots at the forefront signal battle formation. Peace proposals without a sworn covenant indicate a plot. When the enemy's troops approach angrily but remain facing yours without engaging or retreating, exercise great vigilance and caution. If your numbers match the enemy's, it is sufficient. It only means no direct attack can be made. Concentrate all available strength, keep a close watch, and obtain reinforcements. When training soldiers, consistently enforced commands ensure discipline. A general's confidence in his men, coupled with insistence on obedience, leads to mutual benefit. Modern interpretation of the art of war by Sun Tzu, utilizing terrain. Chapter 10, Terrain. Sun Tzu said, we can identify six types of terrain, accessible, entangling, temporizing, narrow passes, precipitous heights, and positions far from the enemy. Terrain that both sides can traverse freely is called accessible. On such terrain, be the first to occupy the high and sunny spots and carefully guard your supply lines to fight with an advantage. Terrain that can be abandoned but is hard to reoccupy is called entangling. From such a position, if the enemy is unprepared, you can sally forth and defeat him. However, if the enemy is prepared and you fail to defeat him, a retreat becomes impossible, leading to disaster. Terrain where neither side gains by making the first move is called temporizing ground. In such a situation, even if the enemy offers an attractive bait, it is advisable not to advance but to retreat, enticing the enemy to follow. Then, when part of his army has emerged, you can attack to your advantage. Regarding narrow passes, if you can occupy them first, let them be strongly garrisoned and await the enemy. If the enemy occupies a pass before you, do not pursue if it is well guarded, only if it is weakly held. Regarding precipitous heights, if you occupy them first, take the high and sunny spots and wait for the enemy. If the enemy has occupied them before you, do not follow but retreat and try to entice them away. If you are far from the enemy and the strengths of both armies are equal, provoking a battle is difficult and fighting will be to your disadvantage. These are principles related to terrain that generals in significant positions must study carefully. An army faces six calamities not due to natural causes, but to generals' faults, flight, insubordination, collapse, ruin, disorganization, and rout. Equal conditions considered, a smaller force pitted against one ten times its size will result in flight. When soldiers overpower their officers, the result is insubordination. When officers overpower their soldiers, the result is collapse. When officers act on resentment without the commander's consent, the result is ruin. When the general is weak and commands unclear, and ranks are disorganized, the result is utter disorganization. When a weaker detachment engages a stronger enemy or fails to position elite troops at the front, the result is rout. Understanding and utilizing terrain, estimating the enemy's strength, controlling the forces of victory, and calculating distances and dangers are marks of a great general. He who knows these and applies them in battle will win. Those who do not will surely be defeated. If victory is certain, fight, even if the ruler forbids it. If victory is not assured, do not fight, even on the ruler's command. A general who advances without seeking fame and retreats without fearing disgrace, focused solely on protecting his country and serving his sovereign, is the kingdom's jewel. Treat your soldiers as your children, and they will follow you into the deepest valleys. See them as your beloved sons, and they will stand by you even unto death. If, however, you are indulgent but cannot assert your authority, kind-hearted but cannot enforce your commands, and incapable of quelling disorder, then your soldiers are like spoiled children and useless for any practical purpose. If we know we can attack but are unaware the enemy is open to attack, we have only gone halfway towards victory. If we know the enemy is vulnerable but not that our men are ready to attack, 
we have only gone halfway. If we know the enemy is vulnerable and our men ready to attack but are unaware that the terrain makes fighting impractical, we have still only gone halfway towards victory. Therefore, the experienced soldier, once in motion, is never perplexed. Once he has broken camp, he is never at a loss. Hence the saying, if you know the enemy and yourself, your victory will not be in doubt. If you know heaven and earth, you may make your victory complete. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Nine Terrains Chapter 11, The Nine Situations Sun Tzu said that the art of war recognizes nine varieties of ground, dispersive, facile, contentious, open, ground of intersecting highways, serious, difficult, hemmed in, and desperate. When a chieftain is fighting in his own territory, it is dispersive ground. When he is penetrated into hostile territory, but not far, it is facile ground. Ground which grants significant advantage to either side is contentious ground. Ground allowing freedom of movement to both sides is open ground. Ground that serves as a junction for three states, giving command of the empire to the first occupant, is ground of intersecting highways. When an army penetrates deep into hostile country, leaving fortified cities behind, it is serious ground. Terrain difficult to traverse, such as mountain forests, rugged steeps, marshes, and fens, is difficult ground. Terrain reached through narrow gorges, allowing only tortuous retreat, is hemmed in ground. Ground where survival depends solely on fighting without delay is desperate ground. On dispersive ground, do not fight. On facile ground, do not halt. On contentious ground, do not attack. On open ground, do not block the enemy's way. On ground of intersecting highways, join hands with allies. On serious ground, gather plunder. In difficult ground, keep moving. On hemmed in ground, resort to stratagems. On desperate ground, fight. Skillful leaders of old knew how to drive a wedge between enemies front and rear, prevent cooperation between large and small divisions, hinder good troops from rescuing the bad, and prevent officers from rallying their men. They kept the enemy in disorder when united and advanced or halted as advantageous. To confront a well-organized, advancing enemy, see something dear to them, making them comply with your will. Rapidity is the essence of war. Exploit the enemy's unreadiness, take unexpected routes, and attack unguarded spots. For an invading force, the deeper you penetrate into a country, the more cohesive your troops. Forage in fertile territories for supplies, tend to your men's well-being, and avoid overtaxing them. Concentrate your energy, hoard your strength, keep your army on the move, and devise unfathomable plans. Place your soldiers in positions with no escape, and they will prefer death to flight, achieving the impossible. Soldiers in desperate straits lose their fear. With no refuge, they'll stand firm. If in hostile territory with no alternatives, they will fight hard. If soldiers aren't burdened with riches, it's not because they disdain wealth. If their lives aren't unduly long, it's not because they don't desire longevity. On the battle day, soldiers may weep, with those sitting up soaking their garments and those lying down letting tears run. But once cornered, they will show the courage of Chu or Wei. A skillful tactician is like the Shui Jian snake. Strike its head, and you face its tail, strike its tail, and you face its head, strike its middle, and you face both head and tail. The question of how to maximize the strengths of both the strong and weak relates to the proper use of terrain. Thus, a skilled general leads his army as if he were leading a single man by the hand. A general must be silent to ensure secrecy, upright, and just to maintain order. He must mystify his officers and men with false reports and appearances, keeping them in total ignorance. By altering his arrangements and plans, he keeps the enemy without definite knowledge. At the critical moment, an army leader acts like someone who has climbed a height and then kicks away the ladder behind him. He takes his men deep into enemy territory before revealing his intentions. He burns his boats and breaks his cooking pots, driving his men like a shepherd drives a flock of sheep, with no one knowing his ultimate aim. The essence of military operations is to assemble the troops and bring them into danger. When attacking enemy territory, 
Deep penetration ensures cohesion, while shallow penetration leads to dispersion. When you leave your own country and cross into neighboring territory, you find yourself on critical ground. Deep penetration into a country is serious ground, shallow penetration is facile ground. When you have the enemy's strongholds behind you and narrow passes ahead, you are on hemmed in ground. When there is no place of refuge, it is desperate ground. Therefore, on dispersive ground, I would inspire my troops with a sense of unity. On facile ground, I would ensure a close connection among all parts of my army. On contentious ground, I would hasten the advance of my rear. On open ground, I would keep a vigilant eye on my defenses. On ground with intersecting highways, I would consolidate my alliances. On serious ground, I would try to ensure a continuous supply stream. On difficult ground, I would keep moving along the road. On hemmed in ground, I would block any way of retreat. On desperate ground, I would inform my soldiers about the hopelessness of saving their lives. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, The Strategy of Fire Attack Chapter 12, The Attack by Fire Sun Tzu said that there are five ways to attack using fire. First, burning the enemy's camp. Second, setting fire to their supplies. Third, burning their transport trains. Fourth, burning their armories and ammunition depots. Fifth, launching incendiary devices or flames among the enemy. To execute a fire attack, one must be prepared with necessary materials always ready for ignition. There is a proper season for fire attacks, which is when the weather is extremely dry, and special days determined by the lunar positions in the constellations of the sieve, the wall, the wing, or the crossbar, as these are typically times of rising winds. In conducting a fire attack, one should be prepared for five possible developments. When a fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, attack immediately. If there is a fire but the enemy soldiers remain calm, bide your time and do not attack. When the fire reaches its peak, launch an attack if feasible, if not, maintain your position. If you can initiate a fire attack from the outside, do not wait for it to start inside, but strike at an opportune moment. When igniting a fire, position yourself upwind, never attack from downwind. Daytime winds last long, but night breezes dissipate quickly. In every army, knowledge of the five developments related to fire, the calculation of the stars, and monitoring for the right days are essential. Thus, those who use fire as an aid to attack demonstrate intelligence, those who use water to augment their attack gain strength. Water can be used to cut off the enemy, but not to seize all their belongings. Unfortunate is the fate of one who tries to win battles and succeed in attacks without fostering the spirit of enterprise, as the result is wasted time and general stagnation. Hence, the enlightened ruler plans well, and the good general cultivates resources. Do not move unless you see an advantage, do not use your troops unless there is something to be gained, and do not fight unless the position is critical. No ruler should send troops merely to satisfy personal anger, nor should any general engage in battle out of mere spite. If advantageous, make a forward move, if not, stay put. Anger may turn to joy over time, and vexation may be replaced by contentment, but a destroyed kingdom cannot be restored, nor can the dead be brought back to life. Therefore, the enlightened ruler is cautious, and the good general is full of prudence. This is the way to keep a country at peace and an army intact. Modern Interpretation of the Art of War by Sun Tzu, Intelligence and Espionage Chapter 13, The Use of Spies Sun Tzu said, mobilizing an army of a hundred thousand men and marching them over great distances results in a heavy burden on the people and drains the state's resources. Daily expenses will amount to thousands of gold. There will be turmoil within and without, and men will collapse exhausted on the roads. Up to 700,000 households will be hindered in their labor. Hostile armies may face each other for years, striving for a victory that is decided in a single day. Thus, to remain ignorant of the enemy's situation due to the reluctance to spend a hundred gold on rewards and honors is the height of cruelty. Such behavior is not befitting of a leader, an aid to the sovereign, or a master of victory. 
Therefore, what enables the wise sovereign and the skilled general to strike and conquer, achieving beyond ordinary men's reach, is foreknowledge. This foreknowledge cannot be elicited from spirits, nor obtained inductively from experience, nor by any deductive calculation. Knowledge of the enemy's dispositions can only be obtained from other men. Hence the use of spies, of which there are five kinds, local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, and surviving spies. When these five types of spies are all working, no one can unravel the secret system. This is called divine manipulation of the threads, the sovereign's most precious faculty. Employing local spies means using the services of the locals. Using inward spies means employing enemy officials. Having converted spies involves capturing enemy spies and using them for our purposes. Having doomed spies means doing certain things openly for deception and letting our spies know to report these to the enemy. Surviving spies are those who return with news from the enemy camp. Hence, in the whole army, more intimate relations must be maintained with spies than with anyone else, more generous rewards should be bestowed, and in no other business should greater secrecy be preserved. Spies cannot be effectively employed without intuitive sagacity, they cannot be properly managed without benevolence and straightforwardness, and without subtle ingenuity of mind, one cannot be certain of the truth of their reports. Be subtle, and use spies for every kind of operation. If a spy reveals a secret before the time is ripe, he must be executed along with the one to whom the secret was told. Whether the aim is to crush an army, storm a city, or assassinate an individual, it's necessary to begin by finding out the names of the attendants, the aides de camp, and the doorkeepers and sentries of the general in command. Our spies must be tasked to ascertain these. Enemy spies who come to spy on us must be sought out, tempted with bribes, led away, and comfortably housed. Thus, they will become converted spies and be available for our service. It's through information provided by the converted spy that we can acquire and employ local and inward spies. Due to his information, we can cause the doomed spy to carry false messages to the enemy. Lastly, it's by his information that the surviving spy can be used on designated occasions. The goal of employing spies in all their varieties is to gain knowledge of the enemy, and this knowledge can only be derived initially from the converted spy. Hence, it is crucial that the converted spy be treated with utmost liberality. In ancient times, the rise of the Ying dynasty was due to Ai Qi, who had served the Xia. Similarly, the rise of the Zhou dynasty was due to Luya, who had served the Ying. Thus, only the enlightened ruler and the wise general will use the highest intelligence of the army for espionage, achieving great results. Spies are a vital element in warfare because an army's ability to maneuver depends on them.